And this I carry with. Mm -hmm. Does it work? Yep, yeah, yeah, that's great. The pointer. Back and forth. Pointer. Back and forth. Yep. Well, welcome back. Uh, let's continue this morning session with uh, uh, Adolf. Sorry. Who will tell us about slide deformation of my life to be as well. Adolfo, please. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. It's also my pleasure to be again back to normality, let's say. So today I will tell you a bit about the S-Falls and in particular about flood deformations thereof. So I will explain what they are and why are they interesting. So this is based in this paper that we published together with Colin Sterks, my student, PhD student, who is co-supervised between Oviedo at ULB, and then some work in progress that will appear soon. And then let me also recommend you to read all these, let's say the last papers, recent papers by all these people here, including Emmanuel, who is uh, sitting in the room, which also deal with S-Force, but sometimes related, sometimes different aspects, but they are very interesting and they all together, they trigger like some activity on this field or this topic, let's say. So the outlook of the talk is the following. So I will start presenting what are s -falls from a 10-dimensional point of view. Then I will discuss s -falls from a four-dimensional point of view, and in particular, why to adopt this for the perspective. Then I will discuss the main aspect of the talk, which is the existence of flat deformations, what they are, and why are they flat. And then I will just mention a few future directions that we would like to investigate. So let me start by describing what are these s -falls in 10 dimensions. So, they are solutions of 10 dimensional type to be supergravity of the form ADS4 process 1 process 5. So the S5 is the 5 sphere. And then you can think of this as having a background which consists of, uh, of a 5 sphere piece. And then there is an additional S1 with coordinate eta that I will make it periodic with periodicity t. And the interesting thing is that the 10 dimensional background depends on this S1 coordinate, on this eta coordinate, in a very specific manner, which is through what is called an SL2 twist. So, this is an SL2 matrix. It belongs to the hyperbolic class. And what it's going to do, what this matrix is going to do, is to twist the SL2 fields, sorry, the type 3 fields, which transform in irreps of SL2. So, for example, it will transform the B2 and the C2, which form a doublet of SL2. It will also transform the action dilaton when you ensemble them into an SL2 matrix. So this is the non-trivial, well, non-trivial, nothing is trivial, but this is like the more important piece, the existence of this SL2 twist on the fields, on the type 2B fields, when performing this further reduction along S1. So the outcome of this reduction is that you end up, if you want, in a background which contains an ADS4. And interestingly, this ADS4 can be viewed as an ADS4 vacuum, as a critical point of a scalar potential of a very specific supergravity, gauge supergravity in four dimensions, which is the one based on this specific gauge group, where you can see the origin of the various pieces here, like, for example, the SO6 piece arising from the S5, from the isometries of the S5, and the SO11 precisely arising from this SO11 twist uh, that we perform. Okay, So this is what is called an S-fold. So, Several cases have been found 
several types to be backgrounds in 10 dimensions. So let me show you the simplest one, which is a background that is non-supersymmetric and preserves SO6 symmetry. It has an SO6 symmetry. So this SO6 symmetry is a symmetry that you see in the geometry. It's really the isometries of the S5. And then later on that I briefly mentioned some ADS-CFT uh, statements. This SO6 symmetry is going to be a flavor symmetry in the conjecture ADS4 CF33 field theory dual. So this is what I mean by an S4 solution. So you can see that the metric adopts this form. So there is an ADS4 piece. There is the S1 coordinate eta, and there is the round 5 sphere. It is round because of this SO6 symmetry. Then you see the F5 that has no dependence on, on eta. And then you see that, for example, this doublet of two forms, like the B2 and the C2, they are of the form something, this, this math frac B, which is independent of eta, and then it picks up the eta dependence precisely because of this SL2 twist that I was mentioning. And something similar happened for the action dilaton. This is the SL2 matrix, including C0 and the dilaton, the Ramon Ramon zero form and the dilaton. And again, it does depend on eta through the very specific structure of the SL2 twist. So it's again twisting some math frac matrix that is independent of eta. So the entire dependence on eta comes from this SL2 action on the type 2B fields. What makes the whole story interesting, and this is something I forgot to mention, is that if you turn off the twist, so if you take this matrix to be the identity, you lose the solution. So this is not having a solution and SL2 twist in it. This is really generating a solution by SL2 twisting. But if you trivialize the twist, you lose the solution. Okay, so this is important. This is what I meant here by there is no untwisted limit. So no twist, no no fun. Let's say. And there is another example of an S fold, which is again uh, of this form that I'm all the time insisting, like twisting something with the SL2 matrix. But this time the solution is an equals one supersymmetric, and it has an SU3 symmetry. And the SU3 symmetry you can localize it in the geometry. It comes from this CP2 factor, which again upon ADS CFT. Uh, mapping this SU3 symmetry corresponds to a flavor symmetry of what would be uh, the field theory dual, the s fold CFT dual. Okay, so this is the background for F5, and again you get the the doublet of uh, B2 and C2, which is again the twisting of something that is independent of uh, the on the coordinate eta, and in particular this B field is along these two forms, which is one of the two forms in in CP2, and in particular is the one that is charged under U1, and this is why, since this field is charged under the U1, you don't see the U1 symmetry at the solution. You only see the SU3 that comes from CP2. So you don't see the U1 associated with this, because this two form is charged. And again, the action dilaton, as I said, is the result of the SL2 twisting on this math frac action dilaton matrix. You can keep on playing and you can find more complicated solutions. For example, there is also an S fold, which is n equals to two and has SU2 cross U1 symmetry. The solution gets more complicated. So you can see that in the geometry, there is this piece here, which is the S2 originating this SU2 factor. Then there is a U1 here, which is the one that allows you to rotate sigma one and sigma three, which is just the left invariant basis for, it's, it's the basis that you choose to describe these geometries, the most convenient one reflecting the symmetries. And then you see here how the background is. It's a bit more complicated. You see F5 is again more complicated. Uh, you see again that the B2 and the C2 are again the SL2 twist on some math frac two forms, which are independent of the eta coordinate. And again, you get the action dilaton to be the result of an SL2 twist, this time on a more complicated, but it's still eta independent uh, action dilaton matrix. So it depends on certain coordinates, theta, phi, etc., which are coordinates on the phi sphere. They are not coordinate. They are nothing to do with the eta coordinate. Okay. Then you, keep, you can keep on going, and then you can find like the largest symmetric case fold, which is the one that has n equals 4 supersymmetry and SO4 symmetry. So in this case, the SO4 symmetry arises from an S2 cross S2 uh, geometry that you can see here. This is the volume form for the first uh, two sphere. This is the volume form for the second sphere. And then there is also this coordinate R, which is an interval. So essentially what you see is the five sphere as an interval times S2 cross S2. And this time, this SO4 symmetry that you see here becomes the R symmetry in the would-be S4 CFT dual. 
So you can compute F5, you can compute, uh, this time I show here the, the three form field strength, but again, is the result of an SL2 action on math frac quantities, which are independent of eta. And again, something like an SL2 twist for the math frac action dilaton, which is independent of the eta coordinate. So this is the general structure of h false. And whenever you turn off the twist, I insist you lose the solution. Okay. So now I will move to discuss the formations of these s -folds. So why are we interested in deforming these s -folds? Well, s -folds are known to be, or let's say one way of generating s -folds as a solution generating technique is to start from a Janus solution, which have been extensively studied in the literature, starting from a Janus type to be solution at taking some specific limit, okay? So s -folds can be viewed as limiting cases of Janus solutions. But then interestingly, these Janus solutions are areas for CFT3 dual to interfaces of super jam mills. These are configurations of super jam mills in which the couplings runs with certain coordinate, which is going to be one of the coordinate, well, essentially the important coordinate in the S4. And then what is even more important is that these interfaces of super jam mills, they have been classified. Those preserving supersymmetries, they have been classified. And then you go to this paper by these people here, and then you find that the possible interfaces of super jam mills are precisely interfaces of this form. So there is an interface that preserves n equals to 1 and SU3. There is another interface that preserves SU2 cross U1 with a U1 factor being the arch symmetry of this uh, three dimensional city. And then there is a last interface preserving n equals to 4, and therefore the SO4 is identified with the SO4 arch symmetry group. So this parallels perfectly the various s faults I showed you before. But then if you read this paper carefully, then they explicitly notice that there is a way of introducing, let's say, the formations on these interfaces theories, such that the flavor symmetry group, in this case, SU3, in this case, SU2, gets broken. So you can break, for example, SU2 to U1, you can break SU3 to SU2 cross U1 or farther to U1 cross U1. So there is a way of introducing operators on the interface such that the flavor symmetry groups are broken. So we were trying to find precisely what are the gravity duals of these uh, deformations. Okay? So then you can try to hit your 10 dimensional solutions and search for perturbations, but then it's a mess. But instead of doing that, what you do is to use the fact that there is a consistent truncation from 10D to 4D and to search for these gravity duals of these deformations in a 4D language, in a 4D setup, which is the 4D description of these s faults. So the 4D description, as I said, is this specific supergravity, which is a particular gauge supergravity with a particular gauge group that reflects the symmetries of the extra dimensions in these s fold backgrounds. So it is a maximal supergravity, so there is a maximal amount of supersymmetry, and then the only multiplet you have in your theory is the n equals to h supergravity multiplet that contains the field content that I show here. So the metric field, 8 gravitini, 28 vector fields, 56 uh, spin one half fields, and 70 scalar fields. And for maximal supergravity, these 70 scalar fields, they serve as coordinates in a corset space, which is E77 over SU8. And it's going to be important to notice that this is a corset space, so it is homogeneous. So any two points in this corset space are connected by an E7 transformation. I will exploit this fact later on. It's very interesting also the way in which this SL2 twist appears in four dimensions. It appears in this four dimensional setup as what is called an electromagnetic deformation, an electromagnetic deformation. What does it mean? This means that when you have a gauge theory, you need to choose a gauge connection. Essentially, you have to choose which gauge fields and how they enter the covalent derivatives. And in four dimensions, it happens that vectors are dual to vectors, Hodge dual to vectors, and therefore there is this freedom of choosing whether you want electric vector fields or magnetic vector fields to be entering the gauge connection, okay? And as long as matter fields are not charged under the gauge group, then this choice is irrelevant, but at the moment you put a charge particle in this theory, you charge the matter in your theory, then it makes a difference whether you gauge the theory with, let's say, electric vectors, magnetic vectors, or a combination thereof. So in four dimensions, you have essentially two couplings. You have G, which is the gauge coupling in the four-dimensional gauge theory, and then you have this additional parameter C, which tells you which linear combination of electric and magnetic vectors you 
plug into this gauge connection. And what it is interesting is that there is a relation between having this parameter being zero and having a trivial SL2 twist in this S folder story, or having this parameter different from zero and having the non-trivial SO11 twist that I was mentioning about before. Yeah. I go, I, I, I go there. Sorry, I'm going uh, to that. The, sorry, can, can you just repeat the question yeah. for the online? Yeah, yeah, Thomas, oh, I, I didn't let him finish, but I think he was around to ask whether there is a way of getting this uh, twist or understanding this story in going from 5D to 4D, where the starting point is not gauge 5D, but SO6 gauge 5D. The answer is yes, and I'll, I'll go to that. Thanks. So, as I said, so this parameter in four dimensions can be off, and that means that you are not twisting anything in this uh, S-fold setup, or this parameter can be on, and whenever it is not zero, there is always a symmetry that allows you to set it to any desired value, let's say one. And the thing is that whenever it is on, then the twist is on, let's say. It's an on-off parameter from the 4D perspective. If you want to play with the four dimensional supergravity, as I said, it's a very it's a theory with a, with a very large field content, in particular 70 scalar fields. So if you want to play with that theory, the scalar potential will depend on 70 scalar fields. That's a mess. So normally you go to some subsector, you take care of, uh, you do things carefully for that subsector to be consistent in the sense that you set to zero most of the scalar fields, but still you are doing things consistently in the sense of the equations of motion. So you are not sourcing anything, you're switching off and so on. So this, go, this goes under the name of truncation, and in particular, we decided to work with uh, some specific uh, subsector of the theory, which is the one invariant, under the action of uh, this discrete group, which is a uh, set two to the power cube, so three copies of set two, with some specific action on the, on the different ingredients of the theory. The nice thing is that the result, after you model by the symmetry, what you get is a much simpler setup, which is a subset of the fields. And this setup is just a very simple n equals to one supergravity coupled to seven chiral fields that I call them set. So you parameterize your complex fields with a real component and an imaginary component. You go for what is called the upper half plane parametrization. So the imaginary part must be positive. And as any n equals to one model, it is fully described supergravity model, sorry, it is uh, fully described by a Keller potential, which in this case, it is this, and a super potential, which in this case is this. So you can see that the, scalar poten the super potential has a piece depending on C, which is, let's say, like the genuine piece. So whenever this piece is on, because the parameter is on, then you have a rich structure of uh, critical points. Whenever this last piece is off, because you switch off C, there's no critical point of the scalar potential. Okay? So you go for your, you perform this uh, scanning of background, and interestingly, you immediately find in this four dimensional setup, a vacuum which is n equals to zero and SO6, a vacuum which is n equals to one and SO3, a vacuum which is n equals to two with symmetry SO2 to one, and a, sim uh, and a vacuum, an ADS for, uh, vacuum, sorry, which is n equals to four and SO4. And what it is even more interesting is that this, for cases, they are nothing but the largest symmetric case within families of Vacua. So they are like the largest possible symmetric points within larger classes of families. So this is what I mean by these are the most symmetric ideas for Vacua within multiparametric families. So in particular, for example, for the n equals to zero family, you find that indeed there is a whole family, a three parameter family of Bakwa, because the real part of these uh, chiral fields one to three, is, they are completely arbitrary parameters. So you get these three parameters of uh, this three parameter family of n equals to zero Bakwa, parameterized by this, as I said, these three parameters. So this is the value of the cosmological constant, which is the same at any value for this, for any value of these chi fields. So they are like flat directions in the scalar potential and would be dual to marginal deformations in the CFTs. So the scalar potential is this. You can analyze the mass spectrum of the entire 70 scalar fields in the supergravity theory, and then you find instability. So from this point of view, you declare that this n equals to zero S fold is unstable, unfortunately. And then what it is even more interesting is that you can see how the residual symmetry, the symmetry of this S, uh, of this ADS for Bakwa is SO6 whenever the three parameters are zero, but then at the moment you start turning them on, depending on how you turn them on, you get different uh, patterns of symmetry breaking. So for example, at generic points with three different values of the chi's, 
the symmetry of the solution is you want to the power cube. And then when you start identifying parameters in a pairwise manner, you get an enhancement to SU2 cross U1. Where, or if you identify the three parameters among themselves, you get an enhancement to SU3 cross U1. And if you set the three of them equals to zero, then you get the largest SO6. A similar story happens for the n equals to one family. So there is an n equals to one family of U1 cross U1 that depends on two parameters because there are three parameters here, but you find that there is this constraint. So effectively, you only see two parameters. This is the vacuum energy. This is the mass spectrum the, for the scalar fields. And again, you get that in general, whenever the parameters are arbitrary, let's say generic values, the symmetry is U1 cross U1. But then when you identify two parameters pairwise, you get SU2 cross U1. And when the three of them are equal to zero, you recover the largest symmetric point, which was SU3. So you see these patterns of symmetry breaking happening at the 4D level. You can do the same for the N equals to two family that generically preserves, I mean, it depends on one parameter, one free parameter that we call it tau. It has this value of the cosmological constant. And uh, <clears throat> for generic values of chi, the symmetry is U1. And when chi is equal to zero, you get the S2 flavor symmetry. So you see the realization of these operators breaking flavor symmetries in field theory happening as these chi fields, these scalar fields chi, at the four dimensional supergravity level. And they are marginal deformations because a given family has a potential energy that is always independent of these chi fields. So they parameterize flat directions. If you search finally for the n equals to four, solution, then you find that this solution is just a single point. So there is no parameter family. It's just a single point. This is the value of the energy. And then, as I said, there are no free parameters. But I insist we are looking within the set to cube invariant sector of the theory. I will show later on that it is possible to deform it if you go outside. Very good. So now I come to the point of uh, flat deformation. Okay. So the first thing we did was to understand these actions, these chi parameters from a 10-dimensional perspective. And what they do is something nice. So if you write the five sphere geometry in a round way, like uh, using this kind of coordinates, alpha and beta, and then three angles, theta one, theta two, theta three, that essentially reflects the SO2 cross SO2 cross SO2 Cartan's algebra of, of SO6. You can choose these coordinates to describe the, the, the five sphere. And then what you see is that whenever you turn on these three parameters, these actions, what is happening is that you introduce a non-trivial vibration of S5 when moving around S1. And what these three parameters, you can see here, chi1, chi2, chi3, each one is associated to one of the cotons of, uh, of SO6. So essentially, the actions, the chi fields I'm talking about all the time, what they do is to induce a vibration, as I said, on S5 when moving around S1. And this vibration is characterized by what is called a non-trivial monodromy, which is essentially a matrix of this type, which is essentially the one that is telling you how, the, how this vibration vibration is, is implemented. So you can see that the monodromy consists on the, of three pieces, each of them being an SO2 piece associated to one of the actions. And then from this higher dimensional perspective, for the vibration to be globally well-defined when you move around the S1 is from where you see that these chi parameters, they must be compact. So there is a symmetry that allows you to ship them by a quantity to pi over, pi, to pi over t in order to have, let's say, this uh, vibration well-defined globe. And what it is interesting is that the breaking of this uh, global symmetries on the five sphere, they match perfectly the different patterns of monodromies you can have, depending on whether the chi fields are all zero, all equal, equal pairwise. So you see this essentially from the action of this monodromy. And then it was very nicely shown in a paper by, by Manuel and uh, well, collaborators that the kaluza klein spectrum at this uh, n equals to two family of phase faults was also periodic under this shift. So this is like really proving that these uh, high parameters, they look non-compact from 4D, but then once you understand them from higher dimensions, they are, they are compact. So then we were puzzled by the question, why are these flat deformations? So we didn't know why they were flat deformations. So what, in the sense of why they were associated to flat directions of the stellar potential, or essentially why were there marginal deformations in the CFTs? And then we got surprised when we really started looking into this, because what happens is the following. I said at the beginning, the scalar space, the, 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 the scalar geometry in, in the maximum supergravity multiplet is, is 7 over SU8. This, as I said, is an homogeneous space, so whenever I have a vacuum 
of the theory, let's say this, uh, the gay supergravity we like, the one we are talking all the time about. So I have this theory, and then I come to find a vacuum here in field space, or here in field space, or there in field space. Like, for example, if I activate the actions chi-1, chi-2, or chi-3. So something I can do is to use, as I said, E7, in order to bring those actions back to any desired value, let's say, back to the origin, back to zero. But then, since the whole theory of four dimensional supergravity is E7 covariant, at the same time as I act with an E7 transformation on the fields, I need to act with an E7 transformation from the couplings of the theory, which is somehow what is encoded in this object that for people working on supergravity, this is what is called the embedding tensor which is essentially the couplings in the theory. So the nice thing is that when you apply any seven transformations to switch off the actions, the same seven transformation will generate three different theories, theta tilde one, theta tilde two, and theta tilde three. Okay, because I need to act with one transformation to bring, for example, eta one, with another transformation to bring eta two, or with another transformation to bring eta three to zero. So this translates into three different theories that I said I call the theta one tilde theory, the theta two tilde theory, and the theta three tilde theory. And what it is interesting, or at least I find interesting, is that these resulting theories for which the same vacua are at the origin this time without actions, these theta tilde theories are nothing but the original theory and a modification. And the modification is precisely induced by these chi parameters. And what we find interesting is that when you look at this piece, these couplings, the couplings essentially like what you would call this embedding tensor, this is what is called the embedding tensor arising upon a Kremer Shelton Schwartz reduction from five dimensions to four dimensions, which links with the question by Thomas. So, in the end, what we show is that the effect of turning on these actions is nothing but generating the Kremer Shelton Schwartz and CSS twist in going from fat D to 4D. And when you look at which specific CSS gauging you are doing, the gauging is encoded into this matrix, which essentially contains the parameters. And this matrix here is SO2 cube valued, which is SO6 valued, which is USP8 value, which is the compact subgroup of the maximal equal five supergravity. Okay, so E6 is the duality group, USP8 is the maximally compact. And whenever you do uh, a duality twist from 5D to 4D based on this compact subgroup, then you generate a four-dimensional theory with the scalar potential being identically zero, as Kremer Shetan showed. So this is the reason why they are flat deformations. This is the reason why they are marginal operators, because the gravitational description of these type parameters is a duality twist of the CSS type producing a scalar potential B equals zero, identically when you do the reduction. So you don't change the energy by doing this trick. And this is why they look at marginal deformations. And then you can think yourself like that there was nothing special about the construction that I made, so I could apply to this S-fold. Before I said that I couldn't find any uh, parameters to deform this. But now I can tell you that, of course, I can do it. The only thing I need to do is to perform one of these CSS twists in order to break SO4 to, let's say, its Cartan subgroup. So this allows me for two parameters that I call chi1 and chi2. They specify an SO6 twist, in particular an SO4 twist of this type, and then induces a Kremer and Schwartz reduction from 5D to 4D. So I should generate a two-parameter family of uh, s -folds. So what it is fine is that when you plot what kind of s force you get in this two-parameter space, chi1 and chi2, what you find is that the generic point is a non-supersymmetric S-fold with U1 cross U1 symmetry. And then there are two special lines. There is this line over here, where you have a supersymmetry enhancement, because you get N equals to two S-folds with U1 cross U1, which in particular, they are the, exact, the, the ones that recently discovered by Bobbeff and collaborators, so this corresponds to this line here. And then there is another line where the two parameters are identified, which corresponds to a flavor symmetry enhancement from U1 to SU2 cross U1, but it is also non supersymmetry. And in particular, the whole parameter space, since you have these two discrete symmetries, this uh, parameter space can be reduced to this octant here. And then, since these parameters, chi1 and chi2, if it happens that I think it will happen, if these parameters can be uplifted to monogramies again, they will be. Uh, 
periodic for the global consistency of the monotremy, so the region will be finite starting from zero and finishing in 2 pi over t. So this is sort of like the parameter space that we get, and in general we get non-supersymmetric as false. Okay. And what we find surprisingly is that when you compute the spectrum of these non-supersymmetric as false, you don't find instabilities. So this could be the first examples of non-supersymmetric and perturbatively stable as false. Perturbatively stable at the level of the 4D supergenarity level. So then immediately the future directions that we would like to check is, first of all, are these parameters compact or not? There are two ways of uh, answering this question. One way is to uplift them using exceptional field theory to s five monodromies. And if it happens like uh, it is, for, like, sorry, if the story is as for the other S-folds, then these parameters will be periodic for the monodromy to be globally well-defined. Another way is computing the KK spectra at these two parameter family of S-folds and checking whether the spectrum is uh, periodic or it goes back to itself when you shift these chi fields by this quantity to pi over t. This KK uh, analysis, uh, this KK spectrum analysis could be also interesting from the point of evaluating or assessing the higher dimensional stability of these s -folds. Because if there are no perturbative instabilities in here, then let's say it would be interesting to reconsider them from the ads one plan conjecture point of view. Then something else we would like to do is to oxidize this ads for vacua to five dimensions instead of to 10 to five dimensions when these parameters, when these flat deformations are on. Because somehow, we expect these flat deformations to be, to be related, let's say, to one form deformations of super jam mills, and then there will be some issues regarding large gauge transformations and so on that we would like to, to understand better. And this would fit well with the 5D analysis of s that's that, that these two groups of people are, are carrying on. Because we are always looking at S-Force from four dimensions, but these two groups are looking mostly from 5D. So it could be a nice way of, let's say, connecting the two approaches. And then we would also like to, to, to see whether this way of flat deforming type 2B backgrounds is applicable to other, five, uh, sorry, to other supergravities, or maybe with uh, less supersymmetric, uh, let's say, less supersymmetric theories. So thanks. Uh, thank you, Adolfo, for a nice talk. Questions from the auditorium? No, do we have some online participants raising hands? No? Uh, Emmanuel has a question. Uh, Adolfo, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I'm a little bit surprised, uh, if I understood right, you're saying you have a flat direction which connects your supersymmetric vacua to non-supersymmetric vacua. Um, I thought there was an expectation this shouldn't happen. Do uh, you have any idea why? No, actually we were also surprised because, <clears throat> as you know, there were like this flat deformation sometimes causing supersymmetry breaking like from n equals to 4 to n equals to 2. So this you know well, but in this case it happens to be, because if you think of it, it's really passing through n equals to 4, to n equals to 2, to n equals to 0. So it's really, yeah. I mean, it must break supersymmetries in any case, because the starting point for us, the starting point, sorry, for us, is the n equals to 4 is fold. And then the SO4 factor is pure asymmetry. So whenever you do this uh, break into the Calpan, you are always breaking supersymmetries. So whenever you fully break it, you, you fully break it. So. So for the n equals to four case, it's not flavor versus R, everything is R. So whenever you break something, it's gonna be R. Uh, maybe just another question. Um, I guess you can see your supersymmetry breaking also in the USB-8 picture by looking how the spinners are charged under the Pi-1. I, I couldn't hear, sir. So you have this nice method where you use the USB-8. Yes. Or 5 to 4D to get the scalars. Yeah. They're the flat directions. I guess you can then also see what the supersymmetry breaking is by Look. Well, the, <laughs> yeah, this is this this is something we are we are looking at because we would really we would like to see the effect of these chi fields at the level of uh, this is a bit of technicalities, but you know at the level of the fermionic shift matrices just to really see how it's acting. So at the moment we have these actions well understood in the context of uh, SLA basis. So we should do 
similar analysis in the context of the fermionic shifts rather than the embedding tensor to really see how the thing is happening. It should be workable. Actually, we are looking at that, but uh, we still don't know exactly how it works. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, Dieter had a question and then uh, Dan also. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have a question about supersymmetry breaking, or maybe it's also a remark, uh, namely with uh, Sergio Ferrara some time ago, about uh, three years ago, we constructed S-folds in uh, four dimensions, which preserve uh, seven over eight uh, supercharges. So they correspond to N equals seven, um, which is a theory which uh, was believed not to exist. And uh, indeed, I think it doesn't really exist as a low energy Supergravity theory, but uh, it's a kind of a massive gravity theory. So uh, I was wondering um, these uh, um, ways of breaking supersymmetry you describe are presumably not uh, uh, exhaustive uh, for S faults. Uh, I think there are other, uh, other possibilities. Uh, I think so. I think so. Uh, different number of preserved supersymmetries. And, uh, yeah, I, I think so. Which uh, is kind of non geometric theories, which have uh, really an unusual number of preserved supersymmetries. Yeah, well, so first of all, I apologize for not being aware of the, I mean, I completely missed the, the papers, I'm sorry. And, um, and yeah, I mean, this classification was based on, as I said, that's like, a, like really breaking supersymmetries through through marginal deformations, let's say through flat uh, directions in the scalar potential. And then the most general thing you could think of is the most general CSS gauging, which is not what I discuss. What I discuss is a particular case, which is, let's say, uh, SO6 uh, twist. But in principle, you could do full USB8 twist. And in principle, that would give you, uh, let's say, other ways of breaking it. But I don't know if they would be compatible with the five sphere picture, because the five sphere picture is the one that is forcing us to choose SO6 twist. But maybe if you have more general s faults with other internal geometries, times an S1, and you play this SL2 twist on the S1, maybe some more general CSS gauges could appear. Our construction is similar to the s faults of n equals 4 super young mills, where you can do also s faults, and then you also end up with, the, with a strange number of supersymmetry, because in this case you get n equals 3 uh, supersymmetric uh, feed series, which also uh, were not believed to exist uh, before the construction. Yes, I mean, as I said, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I haven't read the paper, so, but I, I will look at it to see exactly how it's happening. So thanks for pointing it out. Okay, and then there was a question by Dan. Okay. Um, thanks, that's great. Uh, sorry, more supersymmetry breaking. Um, is it possible that they're supersymmetric, but to some spinner parameter that's not in the consistent truncation ansatz? You mean the consistent truncation ansatz? You mean in the full uh, for the supergravity or within the set to Q of invariant sector? Yeah, 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 yeah. For example, this, the last two parameters I showed, they were not in the set to Q of invariant sector. So they were outside the, the, this model we were looking at. Just so I understand, but when you say it's not supersymmetric, you mean from the point of view of the truncated theory? I mean from the point of view of the, you, you take, you compute the eight gravity masses, not within the truncation, but in the full n equals to eight supergravity, you compute the eight gravity masses and you check whether the solution is supersymmetric with respect to any, not necessarily the ones being retained by the truncation, but in general, the full eight gravity. Is it possible when you uplift? It's possible too. When you uplift, is it possible there's some other supersymmetry parameter which is outside the truncation to n equal eight and it's supersymmetric? It could be, you mean the KK, yeah, it could be. And actually, in the in a paper by Emmanuel, there was a nice phenomenon happening. It was not related to supersymmetry, but it was related to gauge symmetry, in which you have enhancements of uh, gauge symmetries because of vector fields at higher KK levels that become much less. So it could happen something like that, yes. But I don't know, eh? it could. Okay, and the last question. Well, 
what's the expectation on the CFT side? I mean, if I understand what you're saying, then there's a conformal field theory, and I can switch on a marginal operator, and when I it and it should be exactly marginal, and when I do so, it breaks supersymmetry. Are there examples of this? Well, actually, this is what I meant in the last point by understanding the one form deformation, like Wilson lines, because somehow. According to the classification of the possible bosonic deformation, which is something you do in conformal supergravity, as we learned yesterday, there is this one form deformations that live in the same representation as the chi fields, so they must be related. Then, normally, in the Janus literature, people get rid of this one form deformations, let's say, without much regard for large gauge transformations. And since here you have all this detailed business about the twisting and so on, it could be non-trivial how these one forms are entering here, these Wilson lines are appearing here. But this is what I meant by understanding the oxidation to 5D, to know exactly what are you doing on super jam mills to see. expect the large gauge transformations to quantize your twist parameters, and that should be the only effect, no? But, the, but this twist parameter is already quantized by other reasons, by other reasons. Yeah. Okay, thank you for a nice discussion and to take it also for this inspiring talk. Thanks. Okay, next speaker is, uh, the next speaker is uh, Ivano Basil. Thanks. And uh, well, hopefully we have a talk. Should I hold this? Otherwise, it will fall. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> gravity, right? Okay. Arrived in the last moment. <laughs> Things to work? Yeah, works. And uh, Ivano will tell us about non supersymmetric brain dynamics and the soft plan. Thank you very much. So it's a bit bizarre giving a talk in person after all this time, but really, I would like to, thanks, to thank the organizers for, for this opportunity. And my talk will pick up from uh, where Carlos talked from yesterday, left off. So I will focus on the dynamics of brain supersymmetry breaking. And so before I start, you know, getting into details, I would like to make two points. So first of all, you know, Carlo explained lots of details about brain supersymmetry breaking, but I, I would like to make the very simple observation that just by dimensional, dimensional uh, considerations, it looks like that, you know, from the point of view of string theory, it's the natural thing to do because there's just one scale of a prime it's somehow more natural to think about string scale supersymmetry breaking in this context. And this has been recently supported by you know, uh, some amount of work in the Swampland program. There are some considerations that support the idea that light gravitino masses are somehow in tension with uh, UV completeness, with consistency of the theory. And a second point I would like to make is that these kinds of dramatic supersymmetry breaking mechanisms are often seen as, seen as somehow bad because they usually lead to all sorts of uh, nasty instabilities, right? But as we shall see later, these you know, things may not be so bad after all, because these instabilities can actually connect to some interesting phenomenology in the form of uh, uh, brain world uh, cosmology. So, let me now just very briefly present the, the models I will talk about. So I'm not gonna focus exclusively on brain supersymmetry breaking, but I'm going to like compare two models. 
So one is the perhaps the simplest brain supersymmetry breaking model, the Sugimoto model, which arises as an orientable projection of the type 2B string. And the uh, non supersymmetric counterpart is a, a, an orientable projection of the type 0B string. So it's just, you know, supersymmetry is completely absent from the outset. And the tachyons that are present in the original type 0B model are projected out by this, uh, this procedure. So in both cases, one ends up with uh, orientable models with no tachyons, at least in, in string perturbation theory. And in one case, supersymmetry is completely absent. And in the other case, it's broken or uh, no linearly realized in the open string sector, as Carl explained very well. So at the end of the day, one finds you know, some other additional uh, entries in what one could call the famous duality hexagon, right? And perhaps you know, the final uh, aim of all this research program is to understand whether they belong here whether they are actually, you know, they can be consistent in, in some way and part of string theory proper. In order to do this, uh, as I anticipated, I'm gonna study dynamics um, because, you know, breaking supersymmetry has all sorts of consequences, even in the simplest cases of, you know, the, the vacuum itself. And in order to do this, it turns out to be very useful to introduce brains in the picture. And, and I'm not just talking about the the nine brains that you have to introduce to cancel anomalies and uh, you know, make the identical projection consistent. Also, lower dimensional brains are useful because they introduce fluxes, charges, which balance out the, uh, the runaway tendencies of the, brain su of the supersymmetry breaking ingredients. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Carlo has already said uh, a lot about this, so I will, I will try not to uh, use up too much time, but the punchline that I, you know, the, the important result that I need from the uh, brain supersymmetry breaking setup is the appearance of this dynamical couple. So it, it arises from the residual tension of the combined objects that one introduces in space and when performing the, the projection, namely, you know, the O-plane and the D9 brains, anti-D9 brains in this case. And whereas in supersymmetric projections, the final combined tension vanishes, in this case it doesn't, and it produces a low energies, an effective exponential potential for the dilaton, which has all sorts of uh, dramatic consequences. So despite the absence of tachyons in the spectrum, there is a violent back reaction going on, at least if one just leaves the theory as is. So how to deal with this? And, and this is where the brain comes in, brains come in. Uh, so there are a lot of you know, approaches that have been uh, investigated to deal with these kinds of, uh, these kinds of effects. But you know, in this case, we cannot just modify the model in order to, to cook up you know, a, a parametrically suppressed vacuum energy, which is essentially amount, amounts to suppressing this T this residual tension, we cannot, you know, it, it, it's complicated. We cannot just, the model is very rigid because it's so simple. And so we are going to focus on introducing a new parameter, a new expansion parameter, because this, this T is completely fixed by the theory. It's, it's a, it's a well-defined value. And this expansion parameter turns out to be the number of brains of, of charged brains uh, that we put in space time to control uh, to control things. So this is not you know very dissimilar from the run of the mill cases of like very massive black holes where the curvature at the horizon gets smaller the more mass you put in, right? That's that's a very similar concept. So now if there are no questions about this uh, general setup, I'm going to enter into the details of what happens when one introduces brains in the in the theory and how the low energy dynamics back reacts to the combination of brains and the dynamical tadpole. So at low energies, as I anticipated, one finds the usual uh, you know, run of the mill uh, gravitational action. I shouldn't call this a super gravity because of you know, obvious reasons. And furthermore, there is this exponential potential for the dilaton that arises. 
So as anticipated, one can introduce brains and uh, you know, in, in the low energy picture, they manifest themselves as sources, charged sources that produce fluxes. And so what, what can we do with this? So the, the, the simplest direct thing that one can think of is just look at warped flux compactifications, right? And see what the final backgrounds can look like. And one may even hope to find some de Sitter solution, right? Because in some sense, this, you know, the energy density produced by the brain supersymmetry breaking mechanism is, is positive, right? So it could work, except that it doesn't, um, because one can prove quite straightforwardly that the final cosmological constant in any compactification of this sort, quite generally, is never positive. And actually, this combination of parameters is, is fixed in our models. You can just compute it and you find that it's actually strictly negative all, uh, always. And furthermore, the exclusion of the sitter from this setup uh, is compatible with the, with the desitter conjecture in the sense that it's, not, it, it's excluded in a very specific way, namely the, the, the length of the gradient of the potential in field space is bounded by the potential itself with an order one constant in Planck units. So, okay, scratch the sitter. Let's do something different. Let's work with the simplest uh, brain configurations we can think of. So just a flat stack of parallel brains. What happens? Well, uh, already in this very simple scenario, a very peculiar geometry uh, shows up. It's, it's quite different from the supersymmetric cases. And so, so just writing out the most general ansatz, right, with, with some fluxes, which, which is supposed to be proportional to the number of brains that one puts in, solving the equations of motion becomes extremely difficult because of the dynamical tuple, which renders the, the equations non-integrable. But still, one can make some considerations in the um, near horizon regime and in the, what, I, what one could call the far away regime, the intermediate regime is very nonlinear and needs to be computed numerically. And even then there's a lot of instabilities going on, numerically speaking. But one finds that in, in, in the case of charged brains, things simplify a lot because the near horizon regime becomes a very simple ADS times S compactification very reminiscent of the type to be D3 brain uh, configuration. And, and this configuration is this, this uh, local geometry is weakly coupled, the more brains one puts in. So this is, a, this is exactly what we wanted. We wanted to find a weakly coupled background on which to study the physics. But then once one gets far away from, uh, from the horizon throat, the near horizon throat, space appears to expand at first, but instead of opening up into flat space, which is what happens in uh, the supersymmetric cases, in, in these theories, flat space doesn't exist. It's not a solution of anything due to the expansion potential. So instead, space decide, decides not to exist anymore, and it closes off at a finite proper distance from the throat. This is a very peculiar thing, and it's completely universal. It doesn't depend on which kinds of brains you put in, whether they are charged or not, it's, it's a very universal feature that, it's, that rests on the presence of the dynamical tuple. So just getting into a bit more detail, the near horizon region can be studied, you know, working out the peculiar expression of ADS times S in this coordinate system. Of course, one can change coordinates afterwards to recover a more familiar geometry. And the most, the, the important thing though, is that the curvature radii of ADS and the sphere scale with a positive power of the number of brains, which means that the more brains you put in, the less curvature there is. And furthermore, the, the string coupling e to the phi is also a constant and uh, is parametrically small for large n, which means that one can kill two birds in one stone. One can get both small curvature and small string coupling 
uh, just putting a large number of brains in the, in the picture. And, and one may wonder how this ADS times as geometry can be realized as, an, as a new horizon float. In the sense, one needs to be able to. Uh, sorry, uh, it seems to be a question from an online audience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no. We'll just, uh, okay, sorry. No. Okay, I'll, I'll just go on then. Maybe later. Sure, sure. First. So, what happens is that one can actually approach this, uh, this near horizon geometry from the far away region because there are radial perturbations that die out, they, they go to zero toward the horizon, which is exactly what happens in the more familiar supersymmetric cases. Think about the rs nerd nordstrom uh, black hole, for instance, or type 2 uh, D3 brains. And then there are two radial perturbations which just blow up at the horizon. They signal the appearance of a proper horizon at a finite distance, which again is analogous to the extremality breaking deformations of the more familiar cases, which are integrable. So this looks like a bona fide near horizon geometry. And then going far away, oh wait, of first I would like to mention what happens with D3 brains. So th th this, this uh, result uh, holds for all dimensions except P equals three, so D3 brains. And this is peculiar because in the supersymmetric setting, D3 brains are the only case in which this happens. So it's somehow mirroring, you know, it's a complementary uh, result. In this non-supersymmetric case, in particular in the type 0b uh, model, which has different brains, charged different brains, instead of finding this precise ADS times S exact solution, one finds a quasi ADS times S solution in the sense that for a large number of brains, locally, the curvature radii and the uh, thought coupling, if you will, are their supersymmetric counterparts up to one over n corrections. But this limit, this larger limit is non-uniform because there's um, a coordinate dependence that blows up eventually. So no matter how large N is, one can go near enough to the brains that, it, that the correction becomes uh, you know, comparable to the, to the linear term. So apart from this case, well, actually regardless of, of the subtlety, as I, as I anticipated, the far, right, the far away region it's completely universal because it's dominated by the tadpole instead of the fluxes. And so, you know, one can study the resulting equations of motion doing some asymptotic analysis of them. And one finds that the blow up of the various dynamical uh, functions is such that the singularity occurs at a finite proper distance. This is, you know, very exotic behavior due to the kind of supersymmetry breaking that we're looking at. And it has been reconsidered recently in the, con in the context of the swamp and distance conjecture uh, yeah, in these papers by the Madrid group. So uh, and let me just you know, focus very briefly on a special case of this. So I told you that these equations are extremely complicated, very nonlinear. One can do quite little with them. But in this very specific case of D8 brains, which are uncharted, the system becomes integrable. And one actually recovers the, the dust murat solution that was found 20 years ago. And uh, so this is somehow reassuring because it means that you know, brains are all over the place in these models. Whenever one finds a solution that looks sensible, it looks like it can be realized with some brain configuration. And uh, so th this very simple geometry only has a warped interval and the rest is, uh, you know, conformal to flat space. And furthermore, it is perturbatively stable, you know, at, at least as far as uh, classical fluctuations go. But the only, you know, th th this analysis cannot be reliable everywhere because, again, some effects of nonlinearity show up at the, edge, at the edges of the interval and some coupling effects take over. So we don't really know what happens there, 
But insofar as this finite three parameter is very negative, um, there is a large intermediate region which is weakly coupled and it's essentially flat. So this can act as a background in which to place, uh, you know, brains and do things. So once we are done with looking at the backgrounds, we can actually look at the dynamics in a proper sense, things evolving, moving in time, changing. And in particular, even if we wanted to just leave things static as is, uh, these uh, geometries are uh, unstable and they nucleate brains. And so we, we went through the, you know, the calculation of the decay rates of uh, brain nucleation and everything. And what I want you to get from this, the, the main takeaway is that the only way the, con the semi-classical consistency of this decay process actually implies that the brains that are nucleating have a very peculiar scaling of the tension, which is exactly what you would expect from the microscopic string theory. So we recovered the, um, you know, some strong evidence that the brains that make up these low energy effective field theory geometries and then nucleate and then expand are actually the same, very same brains of the microscopic theory. And again, without supersymmetry, we need to get to grab everything we can to support these kinds of uh, swingy pictures. So brains nucleate, so this is an instability, but as I anticipated, we can actually play off this instability to get some interesting phenomenology. And in particular, uh, nucleating brains in ADS relies at the sitter brain world, which is very much uh, like the bottom-up constructions of the Uppsala group. And one finds, you know, ordinary Friedman equations and everything, and one can realize all sorts of cosmology, uh, the detail of which I won't enter here, but, uh, you know, we can discuss afterwards. Uh, we didn't look at bubbles of nothing explicitly, explicitly but they do uh, comprise an, an additional decay channel that needs to be look at, uh, looked at. So let me now you know, stick with the, with the charged brains instead of the bubbles of nothing. So once, so we established that even if we don't put, you know, even if we don't study the dynamics, it's still gonna arise. Between brains and see what we can learn from them. It turns out that we can study uh, interaction potentials between parallel stack of, uh, you know, separated stacks of brains. And the simplest case we can look at is uh, brains with the same kind of charge. So either in, in these models, either D1 and D1 or D3 and D3. And we can perform a probe computation looking at a very heavy stack, which generates the near horizon throat, which is probed by a, a parametrically light one. And we find uh, interaction potentials that satisfy the Wigarity conjecture in the sense that they repel instead of attracting. And this is due to the appearance of this uh, B naught factor, uh, which is strictly bigger than one, whereas in the supersymmetric case, it's exactly one. So instead of canceling one minus one, one finds you know, a, a slightly negative uh, result, resulting in a repulsive force. And a very similar thing happens for uh, D3, D3 interactions, where the geometry is more complicated as I showed you before. So the, the weak conjecture is realized because of supersymmetry breaking. And now one can go even further, studying interactions between brains that do not have the same kind of charge, or one of them or both are just uncharged. And one can compare in this case, um, probe potentials with actual string amplitude calculations, which are much more doable in this case compared to the charge case. And you know, going through all the computations, one finds that for every combination that one can study in both the probe case and the amplitude case, uh, one finds a qualitative agreement in the sense that either they, in both cases, the brains repel or they attract. And again, th there is this matching without the crash supersymmetry connecting to very different regimes. 
So this is quite remarkable, I think. Here you can see the plots of the interaction potentials for P brains probing uh, the D8, the D geometry uh, sourced by the D8 brains, the dust molar geometry. So interaction potentials seem to be a source of uh, you know, interesting lessons. You get the weak gravity conjecture, you get some matching between different regimes. And, and the last, the very last regime that uh, I investigated in, in this context is, uh, you know, I told you that the one d one brain interactions are hard to study from string amplitude uh, uh, calculations because the three level results vanishes. So one needs to compute the one loop result, which, you know, in, in this context is quite hard. So instead, I turn to the world volume gauge theory to study the uh, one loop effective potential of this theory. So th this gauge theory is fairly ordinary as far as world volume gauge theory go. The gauge theories go, there's your quartic scalar interaction corresponding to non-commutative geometry and brains and everything. And, uh, but at the end of the day, the, in, in the in the at least in the USP thirty two oriented model, which is the brain supersymmetry breaking one, one finds indeed a repulsive potential. Whereas in the other case, one gets just zero at one loop, so one needs to compute higher loop orders. So again, one recovers the weak gravity conjecture even in the in this complementary regime in the world volume gauge theory regime. But this is still not exactly comparable to the gravitational uh, ABS regime, because, you know, as usual uh, arguments, Maldacena style arguments, one needs to compare the infrared regime of this theory to the gravitational, uh, you know, ABS picture. And, and these theories are asymptotically free in the UV, but they are strongly coupled in the IR. So the final part of the talk will uh, address this. So how, what, what can we learn about the infrared of these theories? Can we compare it to the ABS counterpart and what can we learn? So in order to address this, we, we need to realize that, you know, as brains repel, the world volume gauge theory, uh, the, the gauge group of the world volume theory decreases in rank, right? It becomes smaller and smaller. And insofar as it's not, you know, the, 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 this final, uh, uh, a single brain gauge theory, every other gauge theory is a priori strongly coupled in the IR. It should converge to a CFT in the IR, which is strongly coupled and, you know, non supersymmetric, completely, completely inaccessible. But the repulsion of brains seems to be dual in the IR to holographic RG flows, because one can integrate out the brain separation as these people did back in the day for the supersymmetric case, finding an operator that drives the RG flow. And so eventually one ends up in this, you know, in, the, in this area where the CFT1 is at least tractable. So th there are two limits which are tractable here. One is the large N limit, so many, many brains. And the complementary case is a single brain. So this case can be actually studied. And the large uh, limit, which is supposed to be dual to the weakly curved ABS geometry, actually features uh, a light Kaluza Klein tower at infinite distance. You know, this is essentially a discrete counterpart of what one can do studying this uh, studying trajectories in moduli space. These are not, this is not an exact moduli space. It's made of discrete points, discrete vacua. But one finds indeed an exponential suppression of the distance. So rather than you know, learning more about the weak gravity conjecture, we learn that the weak gravity conjecture in this case is connected to the distance conjecture. And furthermore, to the ABS distance conjecture because of the peculiar scaling with the cosmological constant of the Kaluza Klein tower. So this is the more familiar large N limit case. What about the small N limit, quote unquote? Well, in this case, one is, forced to work with the CFT picture, the gauge theory picture. And fortunately, in the, in the RG flow, in the, the final step from two brains to a single brain, one can actually work with, uh, you know, with the, the RG flow is weakly coupled enough that one can compute things. 
one can compute the final uh, CFT using non abelian bosonization. And the leading order irrelevant deformation is such that the distance can be computed using a generalized distance that, that generalizes the more familiar Zamoljikov metric, finding, again, an exponential suppression at infinite distance, this point lies at, at infinite distance, um, of the uh, anomalous dimensions of higher spin currents. So you see, one side contains a light kaluza klein tower, exponentially suppressed, and the other side contains a, a higher spin excitations, which are exponentially suppressed in the distance. So, you know, the punchline is that it looks like the emergence swing scenario is realized fully in this non-supersymmetric setting, along with the CFT version of the distance conjecture, which is very much connected. And the final thing I would like to say is that while in the zero prime B model, so no supersymmetry at all, the final CFT contains just free bosons, in the broken supersymmetry case, actually the free final CFT in the AR recovers supersymmetry. And it does so thanks to the triality of SO8. So there's a nice, inter nice interplay between the maths. Um, the fact that, you know, eight is the number of transverse dimensions of a string and not something else. So the emergence string conjecture is satisfied. So this is just a summary of uh, what I talked about. I, hopefully it was clear enough. And, you know, there's, there look, it looks like there are interesting connections between all this network of swamp plane criteria and the dynamics of brains that could lead us to understand them more, you know, without the crutch of supersymmetry. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ivana, for a very nice and clear presentation. We have time for maybe one or two quick questions from the audience in the amphitheater. Uh, okay. uh, thanks, Ivano. Very nice talk. Um, Who's talking? Oh. Hi. <laughs> um, so you, you talked about getting a handle on this back reaction. Yeah. Where you've uh, mentioned that. Um, Possibly you could use our type of um, sort of uh, compactification of this tachyonic uh, vacua. Well, the, you mean the non-tachyonic ones? Well, the compactifying the tachyonic ones. Oh, and yeah, the, the, as, as an alternative approach. Yeah, yeah. 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 So right, so, well, I, I mean, we actually, you know, talked about this. Uh, well, I, I believe you're more of an expert than me on this, but... So I mentioned them as an alternative uh, way. Let me get there first. Yeah, because again, in the, these models cannot be just played around with that easily. So, the, you know, these models already feature no tachyons uh, without compactifying anything. So, um, so these are an alternative, uh, you know, type of models, which you know very well, in which you start from a, 10 dimensional uh, tachyonic model, and then you compactify in a, such a way that the tachyons are removed. So, uh, as far as I know, the worksheet uh, swing perturbation theory of these models is uh, you know, quite intriguing because you, you already have a lower dimensional theory, but you don't have the, the tachyons. But the problem, and, and here perhaps comes the answer to your question, is that the back reaction could completely screw up the compactification. Right? Because who, to, who, who can um, you know, assure that you get an actual torus? Because in order to get a tractable uh, worship theory, more or less you need to compactify on a torus or a project on an orbifold of a torus, which is very sen sensitive you know, to, to the back reaction. As soon as you turn on the dynamics, you know, the torus is gonna blow up in some weird way. So even if you don't have tachyons or moduli, uh, or, or maybe they look like they are exact moduli, they're gonna interact in a super complicated way that it's gonna blow up uh, the, the, the flat space description. And so what I think could be a promising way forward would be to reconstruct somehow, perhaps through swing amplitude calculations and EFT matching, the effective field theory, the effective action 
that governs the lower dimensional theory, along with uh, you know, the, the explicit scalar uh, fields that govern the internal geometry to see if there are some runaway effects like the ones I talked about that perhaps you know, dynamically blow up the Deirdre dimensions again, or, or maybe they can balance with some fluxes and you know, the usual uh, considerations. Um, so it, it's hard to say, to predict, but I do think that that would be very nice uh, to do. Thanks, very interesting. Thanks. Uh, do we have any more questions here? Or maybe online? Was there a question? No. Okay, if there were no more questions, like, thank you, Anna, again for a nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we are moving uh, on to the final presentation of this morning. It will be talked by David Austin, who will uh, tell us about uh, exceptional world volume uh, currents and their algebras. If the title is the same? Yes. OK. So please. Thanks. Okay, so uh, thanks very much for staying around instead of going for lunch. Um, so the, the title of my talk could have also been Brain Dynamics, um, but from a very different point of view, namely from uh, exceptional um, qualities of the trees. So let me uh, motivate that. So we have in string M theory, the dualities in string theory, the ODD Z duality, which is T duality in uh, M theory, the EDD Z dualities, which the U dualities, which are equivalents of different theories, different backgrounds. In case of string theory, it would be different string theories in different backgrounds. Or in case of the exceptional um, dualities, could also be different objects, different world volume uh, theories, which are connected. We restrict on masses modes, also the gravities. We drop the Z and go to uh, like real numbered things. And what one might want to do is, because they are <coughs> physical symmetries, we would like to get a um, nice mathematical description of these. So we would like to geometrize these actions of these duality groups. So there's really two approaches. One is called generalized geometry. Uh, where we extend the tangent bundles in a way so that these duality groups act in a natural way on them. Another way is to extend our space time in a way that these duality groups act on them. I will use both names uh, interchangeably during this talk. And yeah, so this extended field, theory, extended field theory is basically like that we extend, and then we have a duality variant constraint which restricts us again to our wished for space-time dimension. So this is what one typically does. So this is a very uh, well-established uh, setup. Um, and now I would like to go um, in the opposite direction. Uh, giving such a setup, what are typical canonical world volume theories which can be defined with data from the standardized geometry? So far, this has been done mostly for strings. And um, I would like to extend this to arbitrary world volume theories and supergravity. So I know the question is, why would I like to do that? Because in case of string theory, this has been very um, useful. So for example, if you want to study generalizations of t-dualities, non-abelian person lead t-dualities, if you want to study integrability, um, or if you want to look for non geometric interpretations of backgrounds, um, we all need to understand what the phase space or the Hamiltonian formulation is. So if we look for the dualities, um, we would need to um, find canonical transformations which correspond to the dualities. If we are, look for integrability, we want that these conserved charges are independent. Or if we have non-geometric backgrounds, we would look for directly for non-commutative coordinates or something like that. So, general from um, 
a geometric understanding of the Hamiltonian formulation, one can get some nice intuition uh, for various things. And the set for string theory, this is an old story looking at the Hamiltonian formulation. And this is also like something like the origin of the connection of these duality groups to, to string theory. So how this roughly uh, works, I will explain it in more detail later, is that the so-called generalized metric of a generalized geometry corresponds to the Hamiltonian and the so-called invariant metric duality group will define the Poisson brackets. So now the question is, do similar mappings also work for other objects in supergravity, membranes and five brains, dependent or other objects? And yeah, the aim is, so we look for convenient uh, coordinates of phase space, which on which generalized geometry they can act and then look for Hamiltonian Poisson brackets, which will be defined in a very similar way. And then also the other question is, we know that the exceptional uh, duality group acts between these objects. How can um, these formulations, which uh, some of you are like actions known, how can they be connected directly in a geometric way? This will also be a question that will be answered in the end. So what I will do, I will start with a small introduction to generalized geometry. Then we'll review the case of the string and the ODD duality group, and then try to generalize the fictional case, first discussing the already known, um, how the, it looks for membrane in the SL5 theory, which would be a compaction of four-dimensional space, and then using that to generalize to a general setting, and then derive from that basically the uh, M5 brain. Um, okay, so let's start by reviewing the basic generalized geometry. So in Riemannian geometry, we have the tangent bundle, like something like a GLD structure and a metric. For these duality groups, um, for a nice action of the duality groups, which I noted here. So for string compactified in D dimension will be ODD, for M theory compactified in four dimensions will be SL5 or E44, for five dimensions will be SO55, spin55, and for six dimensions will be E66. And the generalized tangent bundle will be objects like that. So tangent bundle plus um, forms, one forms for ODD, multiforms for uh, the other cases. And then one difference in comparison to ordinary geometry is that it will turn out that for the world volume theory, we also need always a second bundle, which will be just um, functions in case of the ODD, and this weird bundle, uh, cotangent bundle plus four forms in case uh, of the exceptional groups. And so the indices, and so two D-dimensional indices here, or the 10-dimensional indices, for example, here, four plus six, two forms, um, they are so-called R1 indices. So R1 is a representation of the duality group. And for these other bundles, they are called R2 in my conventions now. And the defining object of these bundles, in some sense, is that we have an invariant. So on this tangent bundle, this cotangent bundle, we have the invariant ODD metric. And for the other exception things, you have different kind of uh, things, which can always be written like this eta symbol we call. And this eta symbol has an R2 index, which is curly indices, and two R1 indices. Okay, and why would we do that? Because we can define a nice uh, generalized lead derivative on these bundles. So like schematically, it looks like follows. If we have a, a vector plus a form, instead of defining the generalized lead derivative the usual way we define like follows the vector part is normal lead derivative, then we have lead derivative first phi on the second form, and then we have this combination. Like this, it's not apparent that it's uh, connected to these duality groups, but we can write it out in terms of these big generalized tangent bundle indices. And then we can see that we can write generalized lead derivative like that in terms of these phi's. We have a normal lead record part, and then that part corresponds to this y tensor. So, and this y tensor is 
given by a contraction of these invariants. So this, like this, we see that we have defined a Lie bracket that is invariant under these duality groups or covariant. So the Lie covariant, it is not skew-symmetric in general anymore, and it fulfills a Leibniz identity instead of the covariant identity. And as I mentioned, in terms of uh, geometry, in real geometry, we have the normal metric. In generalized geometry, we have also a metric, generalized metric in addition to this invariant objects. I will not use the concrete form just to give you an idea if you haven't seen it. So it encodes for um, the ODD case, a metric and a two form. And for the uh, exceptional case, for example, you can parameterize it like that. There's a metric and three form. And this was the generalized geometry setup. We can also go to this uh, other way of geometrizing the duality group is by extending um, manifold itself. And sometimes I will uh, assume that we have an extended space with coordinates. And so I will use like coordinates X, to which derivatives is associated to T, or uh, derivatives with to x tilde look to one forms and the same thing for these things so these are these coordinates are also represent uh, representation in the representation r1 okay, and um, this constraint which reduces us from these uh, 2d dimensions uh, or the dimension of r1 back to the d physical dimensions it's called section condition it is given in terms of this invariant structure. And just as a side comment in this talk, I will totally focus on the so-called MCO section. So this will be a reduction of these um, 10 coordinates, for example, for uh, SL5 to four coordinates, which will be physical if we solve this constraint. Okay, so this is also the, the normal setup in the discussion uh, of the Wilhelm series. I need an additional object, which uh, I call the omega symbol. Um, and I would, instead of this y tensor, which before defined the tensor leader derivative, I define a p tensor, which um, looks similar, construction of the eta symbols, but plus the uh, omega symbol here. And why do I do that? I do that to write the um, the canonical Lie bracket on these bundles, uh, like in the R1 indices. But this will be not duality invariant. And uh, in many cases, this omega symbol will be skew symmetric in these MN indices, but it's not the case in general. And yeah, just as a side comment, it might appear that this is a very different thing from uh, the geometry, but it turns out that a choice of this omega symbol corresponds to a choice of a choice of physical coordinates so a choice of section so the physical input in fact stays basically the same and just to give you a vague idea um, of how they look so the odd in very metric so is like a identity matrix identity matrix and the omega symbol is just a minus sign here and these eta symbols um, are very uh, complicated to handle in general, but in general they are also just deltas contractions and the omega symbols look similar, but have minus signs in some of the places instead of plus signs. Okay, this was the lightning review of generalized geometry. And now let me apply that to the uh, string and see how the ODD generalized geometry emerges there. So we start with the ordinary string sigma model arbitrary number of space uh, time dimensions. And we go to the Hamiltonian formulation and we see that we can define all the objects in Hamiltonian formulation in terms of ODD generalized geometry. So first turns out that the nice parameterization of the phase space is not given by P or X alone, but we can combine the canonical momentum of this action together with the spatial derivative of uh, X into an object which is on the uh, R1 representation, so on the 2D dimensional representation of ODD. And if we praise the Hamiltonian and the Vizor constraints in that way, we see that basically Hamiltonian 
or the time like resort constraint is determined by the uh, generalized metric, the spatial resort constraint is determined by this invariant metric. And what's still missing is the Poisson structure. And if we just compute using the canonical Poisson brackets for P and X, the uh, Poisson brackets, we see that we get one term which is determined by the invariant metric and one term that is determined by the omega symbol, where this weird um, sum of the two derivatives with respect to sigma, sigma prime appears. So sigma is the special coordinate on the world sheet. So um, in many circumstances, we will uh, neglect these uh, terms because they correspond to total derivative terms on the world sheet. And if we neglect such terms, the Poisson brackets look even easier. So this, we see we have a formulation in which everything is defined in terms of objects of generalized geometry. Okay, now let me uh, apply that to uh, some things I mentioned in the introduction. So uh, the first I'd like to mention is we can also reproduce the generalized lead derivative from this um, Poisson brackets, which not uh, totally obvious. So uh, if you look at, like sections on the of this form uh, on the face space, if we apply um, this Poisson bracket to these sections, we reproduce the Lie bracket uh, on the face space or on the generalized geometry, and if we uh, use this Dorfman Poisson bracket, how I called it, we produce, in fact, the generalized lead derivative. So, in some sense, up to uh, these total derivative terms, like that, um, we have the, that the generalized lead derivative is reproduced on the string phase space. Then we can also get like an extended target space interpretation of. Uh, of that, so we can write these currents in a totally uh, order different way, like that. So we use these extended coordinates, and by that we see that these uh, extended coordinates uh, for a string are basically nothing else than a non-local um, contribution to the momentum. Okay, now we can. Uh, also diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So we choose some sort of generalized field bind so that the Hamiltonian looks like that. So the whole information about the background in which the string moves uh, will be encoded in the Poisson structure. And if we look at this uh, uh, Dorfman Poisson bracket in these A indices, we see that the Poisson bracket is twisted by a term uh, like called F APC, which is called the generalized fluxes. And with this, we can see that in, for arbitrary backgrounds, um, we can write the equations of Morton string in a very simple form. And this is, in fact, the form which you can use to show that uh, generalized t dualities uh, can be uh, canonical transformations. Okay, and also from this form, we can uh, derive non geometric, non -geometric interpretations of the backgrounds. Okay, so this. It's for the review to the string. Are there questions for that? Okay. Not so. We will basically do exactly the same for the um, world problem theories in the exceptional case. So, what we want to do, we want to have very similar formulation, and there will be some challenges. So, first of all, for the string, there was only string theory in the ODD setup. But now we have different candidates. So we need something which determines what theory we will look at. Then we saw the generalized metric corresponds to the uh, Hamiltonian. And we had that this, this eta symbol, the invariant metric, corresponded to the Poisson structure, to the current algebra. And in case of the sectional groups, we don't have an thing with only two indices, so we have an extra R2 index. So we need to handle that somehow. And the answer will be that we need some additional object in this R2 presentation that we contract with that. 
object. And then also, so in the ODD case, all of this is very natural because the ODD, uh, our own representation is three-dimensional, which is also the dimension of coordinates plus uh, momenta. So for D greater than or equal than four, in the general case, this will be not the case for the uh, exceptional groups. So the role of the extended coordinates is so far not clear. Um, okay, and let me mention that there's um, a bunch of literature uh, already for lower dimensional cases. Thanks. Okay, so let me um, maybe skip this and directly generalize to an, uh, the setup for arbitrary p brain word volumes with EDD symmetry. So I will denote sigma the spatial word volume coordinates and d the spatial word volume differential. And I will basically postulate um, a similar formulation of this theory compared to the string case. So we introduce an additional object, which will be a P minus one form for a P brain, which I call charge, which will be an uh, object in the R2 presentation and it will be closed. And from that uh, object, I define um, a P form current. So this will be, would be the E in the string case where the E was kind of a one form. So an arbitrary case will be a spatial P form or spatial top form on the world volume. And it will be a contraction of the uh, Q with this invariant theta symbol and with the extended coordinates. And so that this current will be in the R1 representation. And then the postulates are that the current algebra, the Poisson structure will look like that. So we have, again, this eta symbol determining the Poisson structure contracted with this charge and the Hamiltonian and the spatial deformism constraints are basically defined in the same way. We will have multiple deformism constraints. So we have a free index here and we have a generalized metric as well. So now I've introduced this additional degree of freedom and to um, like understand what this has to be, what the candidates for this uh, Q are, I will require what I derived from the string case, namely that the um, Poisson bracket of such sections, so contractions of functions phi m with these currents, will correspond to the generalized lead derivative of these phi m. So I want that on a phase space of these people in world volumes, we have EDD covariance. And from that, we derive a condition, which I call charge condition, on this Q which looks like that. And uh, yeah, this condition one can solve. And the role of the charge will be twofold. So this condition has several solutions. They will correspond to the different objects that are possible. So it will specify if this, uh, if we have a five form, if it if a five brain, if it will be a D5 brain or an NS5 brain or this one, if it's a string or a D brain. And turns also out that it kind of projects out certain parts of our generalized geometry uh, description uh, because it's just a particular choice of a R2 vector. So the general strategy will be we specify the section. So it's the solution of the section condition I mentioned at the beginning. We so solve this condition, we find charges, and then we have a um, Hamiltonian formulation of some theory. And yeah, let me discuss some of the solutions. So, and also mention that this uh, reduces the condition derived from a different way by actions from um, Alexander Takis was here and Chris Blair. And they also discussed for, uh, these types of solutions already. So for the ODD case, um, the Arturus notation is basically one, so the charge can only be a number, and this charge condition is automatically fulfilled. So we have two choices, either Q is not equals to zero, or Q is equals to zero. So in this case, this is correspond to a string, this would correspond to a point particle, and just to 
see how this happens. So this was a general form for the ODD. K is just uh, not an index, just a number. And so if this is not equal to zero, the Poisson structure basically looks like that. Okay, for the M theory section, uh, we have two solutions. We have a two dimensional solution in case P is equal to two. The charge solution looks like that. So Q is just one form. And it, uh, if we apply that to the Hamiltonian formulation, we will get the Hamiltonian formulation of the standard zonic membrane action coupling to a metric and a three form. And we also produce the membrane, which I will discuss uh, shortly following. And there's another kind of section solution to have to, have to be section. So there will be other kinds of solutions. So for P equals one, we will have two different kinds of solutions, string and one brain, and so on. We reproduce all the solutions. And if we look what the this Hamiltonian formulation, which comes out of this um, postulate is, we will one sees that we will reproduce the standard deep brain DBI actions or the Hamiltonian formulation of those. And in general, we see that um, the charge solutions correspond basically to all of the half PPS objects, which is um, yeah a bit surprising because we just put exception symmetry. Okay, so now let me discuss this uh, a bit more non-trivial example. So the charge solution for the five frame looks as follows. So the charges were P minus one form, so are four forms in general. The, the one coordinates of this four form uh, part of the R2 representation just look like that. And the uh, one form one will look like that. So we have um, contribution of this non-geometric coordinate uh, X tilde in this chart. And so we put this charge into this current and the current look as follows. So instead of just um, P and the special derivative of X, we have basically the generalization of the special derivative of X would be this phi form. And we have um, this slightly weird term with the non-geometric coordinates here. Um, okay, let me skip the side comment. And this means that this current is, uh, manifestly non-geometric and I'd like to understand that better. And in generalization of the string case, we would say that some of the coordinates are uh, correspond to the momentum. So for the string, the dual coordinate was something like the momentum degree of freedom. And for the exceptional case, we would say that these or one observes from here. So in this P, if we do the formula, we see that this X tilde with uh, five form uh, indices appear and for the membrane we would that these appear but now we see that in the uh, m5 brain current also these m2 um, coordinates appear and so one interpretation is um, follows and it uh, comes from comparing it to the known uh, formulation femtonian formulation of the uh, M5 brain action by Passis Orgin Tonin, which was done by these two authors. And if one compares it to the uh, this M5 brain, which is non literature, one sees that when one can identify this combination with the internal self dual gauge field on the M5 brain world volume. And so, in part of this postulate, of this uh, using the general symmetry was also that we postulated the Poisson structure. And if we use this postulate Poisson structure to derive what this com the Poisson uh, brackets of this combination, we get this Poisson structure and we reproduce exactly the properties that we would expect. So this is um, basically the Dirac bracket of a self dual uh, two form gauge field, which is defined on this uh, M5 brain world volume. So, um, yeah, this, this shows so the, the uh, decrease of freedom of the M5 frame world volume are the momentum, the uh, embedding coordinate, and then we have the uh, this form and the 
the gauge field to form and its canonical momentum. And it turns out um, we can write these uh, phase space coordinates or the Poisson structure in this EDD covariant way, which was the one I postulated before. And so the interpretation is that we uh, can have a physical interpretation of these extended coordinates. So the this for the M5 frame would be the momentum, and this encodes in a very we have no local way the um, this internal gauge field. But if we make this identification, of course we lose the D variance. But if we use the setup to use this charge solution and use this identification, we in the end we reduce exactly the um, M5 brain action, which was known in literature. And it turns out this, this setup that non geometric coordinates appear is exemplary for brains. So the same things will happen for the deep brain solutions. So we will have some uh, non geometric coordinates. We make some identification which will correspond to a gauge field defined on these deep brains, and we would um, reproduce the ordinary deep brain actions. And yeah, so this is what I said. The extended coordinates correspond to decrease of freedom, the momentum, and the internal world to engage fields. So this brings me to the end. I will give some outlooks. So what I haven't done so far is compared to the, the NS5 brain solutions and the KK monopole solutions to the known actions and the Hamiltonian formulations. Those, but in general, um, with this uh, postulate, one now can also get some insights into what, um, like a word volume formulation of exotic solutions uh, in exceptional generalized geometry could be. So, and one original motivation was to understand the non perturbative dualities better on the word volume um, level. But of course, this is still mysterious because still M2 and M5 brain have different dimensionality in this. Uh, formulation. Then in everything I said so far, I didn't use that the background has to be a solution of supergravity or of exceptional field theory. So it would be interesting if there is a nice way to, to relate it. But um, yeah, normally it's complicated to arrive M theory from a uh, membrane action. So this is a big question mark. Um, next things, all the things I mentioned about non geometric interpretations. Um, of backgrounds. Um, there was a paper in, in spring, uh, Alex and Mitakis, on uh, where, where similar Poisson structures were derived from um, QP structures and AK access construction. So nice to look at further connections of that. And of course, everything I did so far was only for um, D up to six. So it would be very interesting to look at these two uh, things. Uh, because different objects, geometrical objects would appear there. And then one other part of the original motivation was that for the string, we can see a lot of things for classic dynamics from this uh, Hamiltonian formulation. And for the other cases, uh, there, there has been some insights. So uh, also in awesome paper this year, it was shown that the membrane in the SL5 theory, we can associate solutions to the ordinary action to something called generalized geodesics. And maybe this formulation helps to show that. And the other thing would also be a question with a big question mark is to show so-called non-abelian or possibly U dualities as canonic transformations of world theorem theories. Okay, bring to the end. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, David, for a very nice talk. Questions? Aha, uh -huh, Martin. Thank you. I'll, uh, I have a few questions. I'll try to put this somewhere. Well, one, one comment is that the deep brain. Uh, the ODD covariant D brain action is done by a couple of Japanese people. Mm -hmm. um, 
which I don't think you mentioned. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this what what I do is not. Um, I mean, the, in end, the Hamiltonian formulation of uh, membrane or D-brain is not invariant under the groups because you fix the stretch solution. So this one choice of this Q breaks this. So it's, exactly. it's, yeah. Uh, second point. Or, or. Is that one? Yes. Uh, what, what you, I think it's, uh, correct me if I don't remember, Emmanuel, Asakawa, Sasa, and Watamura, is that right? Yes. Okay, what you, what you learned from that construction and which was sort of conceptually known before was that um, it's that there is a single D brain mm -hmm. and the D brain is locally just like the section, an isotropic. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how it's oriented relative to, to the section, that is how it intersects the section. Yeah. Yeah, this is a which deep brain you get, and uh, etc. Yeah. And that's of course the lesson which you also stress of, of this different dimensionalities. It's it's a matter of you you define some subspace. How does it intersect the section? Um, and then you get these orbits yeah. with with brains of different dimensionality. So that's that's just a comment that yeah. as as you just said yourself. This, oh, this is uh, yeah, this is uh, it's yes. not strictly speaking uh, unduality covariant because it picks out one of yeah. these possibilities and that forbids you to do um, duality transformation that takes you in, into another dimensionality. So it's invariant under some subgroup. Yeah, yes. yeah this is a good reproduced, but yeah, this picture with the uh, ODD and variant D brain is, I actually haven't checked that because I only looked at the like D brain from the um, ODD, uh, EDD point of view. So I haven't uh, looked at the like residual freedoms and choosing something. And I always pick the dimensionally. So here I pick the dimensionality of the thing first. Um, so yeah, but maybe it gives further insights if, uh, compared to this paper, I haven't looked at it for a long time. Yeah. So another another comment here is that you seem to deal uh, exclusively with what we may call the internal dimensions yeah. and not the external ones, which means that you are really doing um, brain solitons. And yeah, uh, is that right? It's right. Yeah. So far, I'm just. Uh, I mean, this was part of like extending it to the, the full thing and looking at, yeah, so embedding it into to other theory. Yeah. We, we looked at this with Emmanuel and, and David a couple of years ago, tried to do, um, include also tensor hierarchy, meaning that, I mean, people set of coordinates. And I mean, the conclusion was that essentially it all seems very, very difficult because in the end, including all 11 dimensions means you have to use E11 and not less. Yeah. Any comments? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have uh, more questions? in the auditorium or maybe online. Now, there are no more questions. Then uh, let's thank uh, David uh, again for this nice talk. And we are going for our lunch break and see you again at four o'clock. I mean, the, the afternoon is online session, right? So online you can follow also from your hotel if you don't, but we can all come here obviously to watch together. Thank you.